My name is Jeff Adams. I'm the owner of Terra Sophia LLC, which is a ecological design, permaculture, and landscape contracting firm based here in Moab, Utah, and um, have been having the pleasure of working with roof catchment systems since being a college student, um, learning first about them back in around 2000, and have been involved in the field and industry um, in various capacities ever since. So excited to share some of my experiences with you here today. And so, yeah, so our topic is, is roof water catchment. So first we wanna think of what is roof water catchment? I, I really see it as part of a spectrum of water harvesting systems, different ways that we can use the water available to us in our landscapes, in our um, commercial, our residential, and our public properties. And so today we're going to be mostly focusing on roof water catchment, which consists of taking water off of our roofs and capturing it in either cisterns or rain barrels, and then having that available for later use. These are often referred to as active systems because we actively have the opportunity to redistribute that water after a rain event and decide how and where we want to use it. Um, another part of the spectrum is kind of what's considered the passive water harvesting features. And those are your, your rain gardens, your bioretention basins, um, bioswales, other different landscape features that are designed to fill up with water during a rain event, during a storm event, and then it naturally soaks into the soil and helps to feed the plants, may contribute to localized um, groundwater, soil moisture, depending on your hydrogeology. And th these systems really go hand in hand. And the other part of the family, just to introduce it to you, is gray water harvesting. And um, Roslyn and I and our local health department, Southeast Utah, Utah Health Department, um, we're successful in really changing some of the state codes to make simple gravity-based gray water systems um, legally permittable here in Utah. And so we did a webinar on that a couple months ago that's available through the link below. And so these three, um, you know, active harvesting in, in roof catchment, passive rainwater harvesting, and gray water are really kind of the trilogy of readily available, I would call them shovel ready strategies for residential use, commercial use and civic use in our in helping to meet not only our landscape water needs, but other other water needs as well. And so some might ask why water harvesting? What's why would we want to take advantage of this water that falls from the sky. Um, here in Moab, I get it rains so infrequently. Why is it even worth it? Um, which is, is a valid question. And it's also if we start to really look at it, when it does rain, there's huge volumes of water running off of our landscapes. And so to put it in context, rainwater harvesting has been part of the ancient strategy for survival in the southwest the colorado plateau and around the world for time immemorial and it has especially modern relevance today with the climate crisis and various droughts most of our state and region is currently experiencing drought with development needing to have additional water to meet needs and so in this picture of mesa verde you can see the black streaks coming off of the cliff here where my cursor is and down below carefully placed is an open cistern so that when it does rain, you're making use of that valuable free resource to help sustain your, your civilization, your um, people, your home, whatever your um, uses may be. There's also a lot of infrastructure and costs that go into supplying water. So this is essentially a snapshot of the Santa Fe, New Mexico water system where water and um, rain and snow melt fill up a reservoir very similar to much of our water systems here in Utah. That reservoir experiences evaporative losses, so we're losing some of that. It goes to a water treatment plant. We spend a lot of time, energy, chemicals um, using mechanization to treat and clean that water, and then a huge portion of that water goes to either irrigating our landscapes or flushing our toilets. It's about 
in in Moab, we use approximately 60% of our drinking water for outdoor irrigation and then toilet flushing is a major use of indoor water. So we're taking water, treating it to drinking water standards and then using it for uses that do not require it to be of such high quality. And so we have the opportunity to look at roof water catchment, passive water harvesting and gray water to help offset some of these uses, making more of our culinary quality water available for its highest end use. At the same time, if you really start to look at a lot of our landscapes through various land use changes, um, some degradations, we have this kind of dehydration stormwater quality flood connection going on where certain parts of our lands are eroding and dehydrating while other parts are flooding. And so by using some of these strategies, we can mitigate those impacts and help to keep water as close to where it falls and use that water beneficially to supply different needs that we may have. Um, there's also a need to protect our buildings and infrastructure. This picture is uh, of a house, no gutters. The rain just falls on the edge. You can kind of see where my cursor is, this black line where there's water stains and damage occurring to the foundation and then maybe 10 to 15 feet away, there's a dead shrub. And so we're allowing this valuable resource to degrade one, re one part of our infrastructure, our buildings or our sidewalks, and at the same time miss that opportunity to have it benefit our landscapes. And so the more we can connect these pieces, the more we can create thriving hydrological cycles within our developed environment. And there's also a range of applications to create wildlife habitat. Um, the picture on the left is a parking lot in Tucson, Arizona, where roof water and uh, air conditioning condensate are captured in a tank and then used to create a water feature and habitat on the edge of the parking lot, dramatically cooling the heat island effect. The picture on the right is a remote water guzzler that captures rainwater off of off of the roof feeds it into this tank and then supplies a little wildlife drink drinker or they call them wildlife guzzlers on a um, remote stretch of desert in new, new mexico and there's quite a few of these in dead horse state point for the bighorn sheep population so we can really start to use roof water catchment to provide a lot of these supplemental water benefits and so i know a lot of people ask is it legal in Utah? Yeah, it's a question we get pretty often when talking about um, roof rainwater catchment. And the good answer is yes, it is legal in our state. Uh, again, I'm Roz McCann with U USU and um, very excited to share this topic with people because many don't realize that in 2010, rain catchment in Utah was legalized through Senate Bill 32, which was then updated in 2013 to House Bill 36. And through that update of the bill, uh, which is our current allowance in the state, uh, Utah allows for annual household rainwater collection through one 2,500 gallon maximum capacity container or more than one container with a total capacity of no more than 2,500 gallons. And so that's, you can harvest 2,500 gallons of rainwater on your property and then use that water in your landscape and re capture some of that within a year period. It doesn't have to be 2,500 per year. That's at one time your storage capacity. And that's per parcel. So if you own a few different parcels of land, you can harvest that amount on each parcel. So back, back to you, Jeff. Yeah, thanks for that overview, Roz. And I think that's, that's really awesome. And um, it's a major step because uh, a lot of other states have have gone a little further and some states like Colorado is still, they're only allowing people, I think it's either 100 or 110 gallons of capacity. And so I think part of the, the key understanding of that that's come out of different studies in Colorado especially and New Mexico as well is that of the total precipitation falling on a lot of our desert landscapes, only an average of 3% of that actually ends up as stream flow. And so there's been a big thought of like, are we inhibiting other people's water rights if we capture 
rainwater? And the really the short answer is no, we're not because most of that runs off and ends up either evaporating or hopefully soaks in and is used up by plants. So this is a way that we can buffer our hydrograph and make more of our precipitation available um, for, for our uses. Um, so the common applications of roof water catchment uh, depends on your region that you're in and what your local codes and other water supplies are, but landscape irrigation is a big one. Toilet flushing, so using this lower quality water to flush toilets um, so that we're not using drinking culinary water. Then there's w different wildlife and livestock uses. Um, significant, uh, in some areas, rainwater catchment is a significant portion of the domestic water supply. Hill country in Texas, the San Juan Islands in Washington state being two examples where they don't have groundwater, so they really need to re rely on localized precipitation to meet their domestic water needs. Some people do it as an emergency water supply or as an extra fire suppression supply just to have a couple thousand gallons of, of stored water on hand just in case. Um, you never know what happens. These systems can be designed to be part of a stormwater mitigation system where they fill up and drain and help to meet the requirement of on-site stormwater management by buffering some of those flows. Um, and then some people do it, they just want a rain barrel. They just want some um, roof water catchment on their property to feel more secure, feel like they're doing their part to conserve water. Um, some of us in the industry like to view rain barrels as the gateway drug because they're, you know, they're 55 gallons. So once you put one in, you realize how quickly it fills up and how quickly it drains. And so then it usually leads to, wow, I need a bigger cistern to handle the volume of water coming off my roof. And some people forget that they have a rain barrel, barrel there or they use it as a buffer so they don't drive into the corner of their house as um, was the case of this picture I took. I think that was in Washington state some number of years ago. So in thinking about how much water you can catch, the first thing is to think of the watersheds of your roof. And so a watershed is a, a geographic area draining to a common point. So anywhere that you have a roof line, um, a gutter going to a downspout, you have a certain square footage of roof area going to that particular spot. And so from that understanding, if you already have gutters or are thinking about putting on gutters and downspouts, you can start to quantify how much water you might have available off of each particular pitch of your roof. And then from there, you can start to make some decisions of whether you wanna keep that roof runoff distributed and have multiple, either multiple tanks or multiple water harvesting earthworks, or whether you wanna go through and consolidate them all into one larger system. So I, I like to start with thinking about what are the watersheds of my roof? Where is water coming from? Where is it going? From there we get, um, this is usually everybody's favorite slide, get a little bit of math in, um, but this is a very important equation because it helps us go from, I'm just going to stick a rain barrel under that downspout to say, how much water can I reasonably expect in a rainstorm coming off this particular watershed of my roof so that then I can decide how big of a, of a barrel or a, of a cistern I want. And so the real quick version is, so you take your area, that's square footage, length times width, times your inches of rain. I like to start with a one inch rain event and then also look at your average annual, annual so you can know what your total um, potential roof catchment harvest is. And then this 0.623, that is a constant that essentially converts from cubic feet into gallons. And so in this example, if we look at a 1000 square foot roof, harvesting a one inch rainfall times that 0.623 constant, we get 623 gallons coming off of that thousand square feet. And that's why you can really quickly see that the 50 gallon rain barrel is going to be filling up and overflowing really quick if you have any significant amount of roof area draining into it. 
um, using Moab as an example, we get an average of nine inches of rain. That means we're getting 5,600 gallons per thousand square feet. So an average home that might be 1,500 square feet, 2,000 square feet, um, you're looking at maybe you know, 7,500 to 10,000 gallons just off the roof alone. And this equation also applies to your parking areas, your driveway, your patio, your shed, and your landscape areas. So you can start to really break down and quantify how much water is actually available to you in each rain event over a seasonal average and over an annual average on your property and start to think about how you can manage those different sources of runoff to help infiltrate them and match them up with your plant water needs. So then you can start to match what we call your sources of runoff with your sinks or your uses of water and start to really mathematically hone in on, on averages, on, on what you can reasonably expect. And of course, nothing is 100% efficient. So we want to think about if you have trees overhanging your roof, if you have a steeper roof and get really high intensity rainfall, some amount of that water is going to splash off and not become available for harvest. So we usually use somewhere between 80 and 90 percent efficiency and um, that's something you'll want to make a judgment on your particular conditions and your particular um, climate factors. But that lowers that, you know, that annual average in Moab to just over 5,000 gallons per 1,000 square foot roof. And if we start thinking about that from a landscape perspective, if you have a thousand square feet of roof going into say a 500 square foot rain garden, you've effectively just tripled your rainfall because you get the rain falling on 500 feet of landscaping plus another two times of that of having your thousand square feet of roof feed into that. So in Moab, we have some examples, the USU Moab campus being a great one where our effective rainfall is three, four, five times the normal average. So that landscape is receiving something more in the 30 to 40 inches of average precipitation in our desert climate because all of that roof water is being channeled into the landscape through a combination of storage and cisterns and direct harvesting through passive earthwork. And so now the different pieces of a roof water catchment system, I call this like the anatomy of the system. What are the, what are the parts we're working with? We have a catchment area, that's your roof. Um, then there's some sort of guttering and downspouting that collects the water from the roof, helps it start to channel it towards your tank. Um, then you want a pre-filtration device. In this case, what's shown here is what's called a debris excluder. And I have separate slides to go through each of these in a little more detail, but that helps keep your water the best quality possible before it gets into your tank. Um, then you have a conveyance that goes from the debris excluder into your cistern. Um, what you can't see is on the inside of this tank, there's another pipe that goes all the way down to the bottom and curls up and that's called a calming inlet. So that's as sediment naturally accumulates in a tank, that free fall of water isn't kicking up all that sediment every time. Instead, it brings the water down gently and bubbles it up from the bottom. So you get a lot less turbulence in your tank and that really helps to keep your water quality higher as well. Um, then there's the tank itself. There's different uh, types of tanks we'll go through in a minute, but you want them to have a way to be vented so you don't get, um, so you can have your water free flow out of there and it doesn't you know, be succumbed to suction. And then usually you're gonna be, wanna be able to lock that or have have some way so that you can't tamper with it. Depends on if it's a private site or a public site. Um, there's a way to distribute it, some way to get the water back out. A sturdy pad can be gravel with edging, can be concrete, kind of depends on your, your needs. And then definitely a way to overflow that water. So when your tank's full, you get back-to-back -back rain events or you get a rain event bigger than your capacity that water has a controlled way to exit the system. Uh, there's some additional components, I'd call them in a way the bells and whistles. It sort of depends on your particular circumstances. If you're in a high wind area, 
or have seismic considerations, you might need strapping. Operation and maintenance is actually part of the system in terms of just some routine checkups, make sure things are functioning well, cleaning debris excluders, things like that. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about distribution. You may or may not want to pump. I, I generally favor gravity systems. Uh, if you're getting into potable water systems, um, you might need some filtration and disinfection, or rather you will need some filtration and disinfection. Uh, then some of the more advanced systems have water level indicators, auto makeups, floating outlets, things that just help to regulate the system a little bit better. But those are kind of the more advanced systems. And for this presentation, we're really sticking on the kind of simpler systems really intended for the landscape applications. I just wanted to point out some of these additional considerations. And then depending on your jurisdiction and depending on if you're having a auto makeup or if there's any potential for cross-contamination, you may be required to have backflow prevention. Um, that was big in California. They wanted a lot of these systems to just in case they get hooked up to a, a municipal supply, supply in the future. So looking from your roof, there's different materials. Um, for landscape uses, I'm not very concerned about whether you have asphalt shingles or metal roof. Um, if you're gonna use it for domestic um, you know, culinary usage, then you definitely want a, a roofing material that is rated for drinking water standards. And that's uh, ANSI 61, A-N-S-I. It's the national, essentially, um, drinking water component standard. And so if you're doing a potable system, all of your materials should be that ANSI 61. For a landscape system, in general, that water is already running into your landscape. Um, there is some water quality concerns potentially, like asphalt shingles do shed a little bit of petroleum. Like, you know, that's, that's stuff that we wanna pay attention to. Um, the big thing here with, with gutters and downspouts is there's sizing considerations. Um, if you have a pitch in your roof, you might need a backstop so that that water doesn't just go and shoot over your gutter. That actually helps to kick it down into there. And then really looking at the operation and maintenance. You know, we hear, hear a lot about in our proponents of green roofs, but green and living gutters are not necessarily something that we want to advocate for. And so routine maintenance of your gutter system, cutting overhanging branches off of your roof are good for your house and really essential to maximizing the water quality in your catchment system. Pre-filtration, I said the, the rain heads, those in a lot of ways are the simplest. Uh, you walk by them, you see them. If there's some leaves that come on, you can just brush it off and go, go along. Um, what you can't see is horizontally in here, there's a finer mesh screen that catches the smaller particles and that also needs to be cleaned occasionally. For underground cisterns and some above ground, there's these basket strainers that do essentially the same thing, but they're inside the closed lid. So you have to look in there, pull them out, clean them. Um, I'd say at least quarterly, but after big storms, after leaf fall that way, just to keep things clean. Um, conveyance to your tank, you're generally going to want to have at least a 2% slope on that pipe, just standard kind of pipe conveyance flows to make sure that that water's moving and not um, weighing down your pipe. Um, a whole bunch of different storage tank options. By far, the polypropylene are the most common, and these can be above or below ground. Um, more expensive, but a little bit more aesthetic are various corrugated metal tanks. Some of these are prefabricated, some are built on site. Concrete tanks are generally gonna be poured in place or built on site. They have the benefit of being fireproof. And then for larger volumes that are generally gonna be underground, there's um, a range of fiberglass tank options as well. And you can pretty up your tanks in different ways. Um, this is the beckoning hand in Seattle. You can um, paint murals on them. This is a poly tank at a fire station in North Carolina that just has one by six boards wrapped around it and a nice metal roof so that you're both protecting the tank and also making it a little bit something nicer to look at than a, than a plastic tank out in the yard. Um, 
there's some special considerations for underground tanks and making sure that you don't get surface water intrusion going into the tank. They also need to be vented and overflowed. You definitely want to make the bottom of your underground tank buried below frost line. And then some of these are rated to be put in parking lots or driveways and you just want to make sure that the tank that you're using is rated for whatever loads you have, including the burial depth of the soils. Clay soils are heavier than sandy soils, vehicle loads. And if you're in an area of high groundwater, you need what's called dead weight or dead man so that the tank doesn't pop out under the pressure of the, uh, the groundwater. Other above ground tanks, you need to either decide to do adequate freeze protection, um, which is an underground tank buried, um, heat tape, an electrical heat tape to just kind of keep those fittings from freezing and splitting can be critical, or you need to decide to just decommission the system for the winter. And there, you know, there's pros and cons to both. Um, system winterization can just be simply reconnecting the downspout to the existing stormwater drainage system, um, opening valves so it can just flush out. And then there's just some issues, especially your fittings are gonna be the most freeze prone because they are you know, a smaller column of water. This PVC pipe is not meant to be um, under extreme temperatures. So just stuff to consider it in terms of deciding to go above ground or below ground and whether to try to harvest through the winter or um, put, it, put it to sleep for the winter and bring it back online in the spring. The overflow, this is really important to treat it as a resource. And this is really where we look to integrate it with our other passive water harvesting treatments and really have that, that tank overflow into a rain garden, a bioswale, something in the landscape so that when there's more water than your tank can hold, it's still going out and helping to feed your plants and soak into the soil. Um, the couple key considerations there too are that you want the overflow to be equal to or larger than all of the inflow piping. So you don't want to constrict it and maybe slow the flow and have it bubble out the um, top of the tank or back up and that you want to screen that overflow for vector control so no critters can get up in there. In terms of using the water, um, again, my preference is gravity. That's not always an option. So pumps are definitely commonly used for a lot of applications. I'm not going to go into the details of sizing or using pumps, but um, a couple key points for gravity systems is that you, you get just under half a PSI per foot of height. So that really helps you want to see where can I put my cistern up a little bit higher in the landscape so I have more options for gravity. And then you want to use these full port valves. This one that my cursor's on where it's the equal um, diameter or circumference of the opening versus a lot of valves, if you look at them, they constrict your flow right off the bat. And so if you're trying to get gravity feed through that, you've right off the bat limited your opportunities. So those are full port hose bibs. Um, and generally you're wanting to use one inch pipe or larger and then usually higher volume irrigation emitters because it doesn't give out the uh, manufacturer's recommended flow rates. Vector control, I hit a bit on this in terms of keeping critters out of the overflow. It's also really screen everything. You don't want any access to the open water that critters and mosquitoes can get into. And this tank on the right, um, these IBC totes are very common. They're actually a great reuse option. They're 250 gallons. Um, you just wanna either paint it or somehow screen it because this dark color of the water is a combination of not having adequate pre-filtration. So some leaves and organic matter are getting in there. And then also that sunlight is adding to algae growth. And so the more we can keep those tanks shaded, painted and screened, the better the water quality remains. Um, might think, you know, what's from a total water budget, what is one site gonna do in the total? And it's, you know, every drop counts. And really a lot of the benefits of this come is like when we can hit a certain amount of scale and get whole neighborhoods and whole cities starting to manage their rainwater as a resource. And that comes through outreach and education, creating public demonstration projects so people can go and 
see and experience what this stuff looks like and how it functions. There's also different policies and ordinances that can help drive adoption, as well as certain water districts have chosen to incentivize or provide cash rebates for people that take some of their water use and turn it over to their local rainwater supply instead of relying on municipal. Um, technical assistance, neighborhood collaborations, and especially for tanks, because often the delivery price is a big inhibitor. So bulk purchasing, getting a whole truckload of tanks can be a way to bring down the cost per person on that. And then I'll turn it over to Roz to kind of recap some of the overall principles here. Yeah, and what a great day to talk about this. It's currently raining in Moab, so very suiting. So um, Jeff reviewed some amazing, excellent parts of rainwater harvesting and um, principles within that. And if you're like me, you're a list person perhaps. And so just to summarize some of what was talked about in uh, list format, Brown Lancaster developed 10 cistern system principles that are, are very helpful. He's the author of Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands and Beyond, volumes one and two. So this is from his volume one work. But um, the first of the, the principles to keep in mind when looking at this type of a system is to ensure adequate inflow. And so as Jeff mentioned, you wanna size your gutters, downspout and inflow pipe to handle the maximum rainfall intensity that it's likely to incur, occur in your area. So you're adequately sizing that and uh, you can search downspout and gutter sizing on harvestingrainwater.com. That's Brad Lancaster's website. So again, that's downspout and gutter, gutter sizing on his website. And I'll put the link in the chat for you all after. The second principle is to ensure adequate outflow and use it as a resource. So um, also as mentioned, make sure that your outflow of your, your tank is the same size as the inflow uh, it must be equal to or larger that outflow pipe so you don't back up your system. And a really best practice for designing your outflow is to use it as a resource to water other plants in your landscape. So you want to direct that to another uh, tank or an, a mulched or vegetated infiltration basin. So this picture is actually showing my rain tank on my property. It's 1500 gallons and the reason that uh, it is covered like this in an earthen plaster and stone bottom and the, the metal and cedar top that it has on there. One, my husband is a builder, but two, the tank that I had purchased used in our community was clear. And so I wanted, I had to put a cover on that to ensure it did not um, receive sun penetration for algae growth. And so the third principle that it, Brad covers in his book is design your system to collect high quality water. And so uh, as we saw in the picture previously, we wanna ensure that our gutters are free of material, but um, also just a general rule is the, the higher the quality that your water coming into the tank is, the more options you have for its potential use. So just keep that in mind and uh, definitely choose materials that are rated for contact with potable water. The fourth is design a closed system that passively filters itself. And so as you can see with my tank, and I just mentioned, screen off that system from sunlight and also ensure insects can't get into your system and other critters. And this will help prevent the growth of algae and bacteria in your tank and also the propagation of mosquitoes. And also um, tank covers will reduce water loss to evaporation. Uh, is an, an, another bonus for that. So construct your outflow pipe a minimum of four inches above the bottom of the cistern. This is a great general rule that he provides in his book because um, that will prevent roots from going up into that, that pipe and uh, accessing being another thing to maintain your, your tank system. So number five is access. Make sure that you can maintain access to your tank and its interior. And you need to do this to be able to um, monitor water levels if you're interested in that, but really to clean out the tank here and there and also make any repairs that are necessary. So you can't see this in the picture of my tank, but one of the panels of the roof actually lifts up and then you can access into the, the tank to clean it out or deal with any troubles that um, might come up in the future. So um, you also, so with that include um, lockable and secure lids that uh, will prevent any accidental ed entry by children. So make sure that lid is not easy to lift off by, um, by a small child. 
And then number six is to vent your tank. So all covered tanks with tight fitting lids or tops must be vented. And this um, will help you prevent a vacuum from forming within the tank when large quantities of water are quickly drawn from it. And so my rain head is serving as that vent system in my, my tank there. Then the next number seven is to use gravity to your advantage. So as Jeff mentioned, uh, if you can avoid them, then um, pumps are just add complexity to a system and you can actually uh, just design your tank so it's sitting higher up on your landscape and then use gravity to pull that water out of your tank and water your landscape. So mine is on a higher point of my property and so when I attach a hose to the outlet of that tank, which you can't see, it's actually right kind of where the dash is between the number one and B for Brad Lancaster. So that's where the outlet is of my tank when I attach a hose to water and I can water my landscape from, from that outlet just using gravity. And I don't need a, to add the complexity of having a pump. Number eight is to make um, rainwater use convenient. And so you wanna really think about where to put your tank on your landscape. So it's near both the water source, which is your roof and the destination of your gardens, uh, wherever it is that you're hoping to use most of that water harvested in your rain tank. And this will minimize the length of your downspouts, your pipes, your hoses, which will all save you money, materials, and um, decrease your odds of um, parts failing the less parts you have and need in a system, the better. And so you can also really better maintain your water pressure through doing this. So two more principles. The ninth is to select and place your cistern so it does more than store water. So this is the permaculture principle of stacking functions. So really think about, this is a really fun part of the process, but as you're considering where to put your tank and what type of tank to purchase, what other functions can that serve? Can it serve as a block from a neighbor's house that you might not want to see, or a, like a privacy screen, a wind block. Um, can you grow plants up that the side of the tank? There's lots of options that you can stack functions with, with that tank. It can also serve as shade in a certain area with a bench on the opposite side, which we're actually installing in the shaded side of our tank at our house. So think about that with your tank. And the last and of course an extremely important one is to maintain your system. So make sure to inspect and clean out those gutters before the rainy season and uh, anytime you have a lot of drop from surrounding trees. So on a neighboring property at my house there are elm trees and for those of you who have ever lived near Sib Siberian elm know that there's a lot of drop that happens of the seeds at certain times a year and so we have to check our gutters during those times and clean all those out to ensure that that um, doesn't eventually start breaking down and clog my rain head, but also just uh, decrease the efficiency of the water flowing into the tank. And if you uh, do use something like a first flush diverter, it, and that's a different part of a, a system, you wanna drain that after rainstorm. So for first flush diverter is an optional part before that water enters your tank where you can do a first flush of any debris that might um, you might want to avoid from going into your tank. Pros and cons to having that. I don't obviously have one as you can see in the photo. So and um, with the maintenance, periodically check your system for leaks, uh, broken inlet screen, things like that. I, I noticed in the last rain event that mine was, uh, the rain was flowing off of that rain head and so I ran out because I didn't want to waste any of that water that could potentially go into the tank and saw that it was uh, the fine screen. There's a a bigger screen that's slanted in a rain head and then inside if you lift that up there's a finer screen and that was actually clogged on mine and so I just um, hit that upside down on the ground and th threw it back in there and, and we were back in business for that. So you want to make, make sure that you are maintaining the system to harvest as much as possible. So with all that, then obviously you're excited and interested in doing this on your own landscape and wondering how to go ahead and register if it is legal in the state of Utah. So um, you don't necessarily have to register your system. Um, where you don't have to is if you're collecting and storing precip with, um, with no more than two covered storage containers uh, with a maximum storage capacity of greater than 100 gallons. So that's per container. So if each container you have and you only have two or 100 gallons, then you don't have to register. If you are harvesting any more than that in our state, then you want to go onto this, uh, this picture showing the Division of Water Rights form. 
this is the entire form. I'm not just doing one snapshot of a multi-page form. It's very easy. I've done it with my own system at my house. And it's just your name, your location, your phone number, and uh, then you provide your email. And of course, the storage size that you are installing on your landscape. And then you submit and, it, and then you have your registration. And so that's for uh, no more than 2,500 gallons on your home landscape through one major tank or uh, aggregate tanks with a maximum capacity of 2,500 gallons. And there's no charge for the registration with the Division of Water Rights. So with that, um, we want to thank you for joining us in the webinar today.